I don't know at what point I decided that I wanted to make games. It was probably sometime after I was given the question, what do you want to do whenever you grow up? And for whatever reason, my brain decided that instead of wanting to go to the moon, design bridges, or whatever actually useful thing I could have decided on, I instead decided that I wanted to make games, like the one with a silly Italian jumper or bowling with both no arms. But that doesn't really matter, does it? The point is that I've been trying to figure out how to make games since all I had was a first generation iPad mini and the vast, very non-child friendly abyss of the internet. So in this video, I'm going to take influence from Two Clicks Phillips and recount my very long journey in the very specific subject matter of making games for computers, all the way from making paper games in elementary school to releasing my first commercial Steam game. My local bus route was really stupid. The route was absolutely whack, instead of going to where my house was alongside most people who were on the bus, and instead drove off to the absolute furthest away house first before coming back. This turned a less than 5 minute drive into a 1 to 2 hour endeavor. So naturally to pass the time, I partook in some copyright infringement. This all started when one of my friends showed me a game that he had either found or made up. It was called War World. Basically, both people draw a fortress on a sheet of paper, and then they battle. So it basically has no real rules or mechanics, and mostly just came down to drawing a fortress and then arguing with the other person on how come your fortress would beat the other person's. It was hardly an actual game, but I figured that it needed a redesign. So I put together a top-down world map, and made a list of units with stats, and even put in a system where you make money, kinda like in Stick Wars. What resulted was a turn-based strategy game where you build massive armies and then fight the other person, and by this point the game had splintered so far off the original War World that it really was not the same thing. So I came up with a genius rename, War of the Worlds. Yeah, I have no idea how this name happened to line up with the 1898 novel by H.G. Wells. I severely doubt that I had heard of it before that and it at least wasn't a conscious choice to name it after that. But anyways, the game didn't really work out. Only one game was ever played of it, and it took months. Remember that this whole game is on a sheet of paper and everything is being erased and redrawn to move. That, combined with the huge army counts, led to turns taking literally forever. I'm pretty sure that we got bored of the game at some point and ended it all gloriously by using the overpowered nuke troops that just completely destroy everything. But fortunately, or unfortunately, depending on how you look at it, I did not stop at this game. And going forwards, the games I would make and play on the bus didn't really improve in quality, but they became more streamlined and also more based on other games. So yeah, there was even more copyright infringement. There was a Plants vs. Zombies game, what were essentially clicker games, a city building game, and much more. But the game that I remember the most other than War of the Worlds is called Arena of Stuff, and it was odd as it wasn't really much of a game. It was basically just a drawing of an arena, and in the middle, goofy characters who we made would fight. There would be no real rules, and it was basically just drawing and erasing scenes of fights, but there were many standout characters. The main one and the absolute reigning champion of the arena was the Jolly Fat Man or the JFM, and now I realize much later that my friend who introduced this character was not actually making a genius, original, hilarious character, but rather referencing Teen Titans Go. And this reference just flew over my head because the only cartoons that I watched were Ninjago. Wait a minute, I'm still black. There were a few other characters, but none of them were as memorable as JFM. Really the only joke was that he would win everything no matter what, and there were all sorts of trophies and stuff dedicated to his honor. So yeah, one basically ripped me off a few years later with One Punch Man. So look who's doing the copyright infringement now. But I'll get back to Arena of Stuff later, as it kinda comes back in a surprising form. This video is sponsored by the generous people at SNHU. If you are interested in making your own video game, then consider this. What if you had the knowledge and experience to make your game a reality and turn it into an actual career with opportunities for growth? If that sounds exciting, and you want to start your own game development journey, then let me tell you about SNHU, who is sponsoring this video. SNHU is one of the largest accredited nonprofit online degree offerings in the country. They feature over 200 degree programs focused on getting you started in or advancing yourself in a career that you'll love. But let's talk about SNHU use game development program. In this program, you'll learn how to create realistic, dynamic gameplay experiences with game AI, game physics, 2D and 3D graphics, and interface design. You'll also learn computer programming languages like C++, C Sharp, and Java. And you'll learn 3D modeling and texturing of game art software. Courses are taught by industry experts who will teach you how to research, develop, and contribute to advances and trends within the field of game programming. And all of SNHU's programs are extremely flexible. There are no set class times, allowing you to work when and where you want. If you started college, and never finished, SNHU will let you transfer up to 90 credits so you don't have to start over. That's up to 75% of a bachelor's degree and up to 33% of a master's degree. SNHU is radically affordable. Their online tuition rates are some of the lowest in the nation. If you are interested in checking out SNHU, then go to this link, snhu.edu. This link is in the description and top comment of this video. 
But for now, I'm just going to quickly brush over the other things I wasted my time on in elementary school and early middle school. First off, animation. I really liked animation. I first got into it with LEGO Animation. I saw the stop motion app that was made after the LEGO movie, which was put in a LEGO magazine. And thanks to the power of Google Photos, I still have most of these animations that I made back then. And some of them kinda still hold up. Although most of my early work was very low frame rate, since I didn't want to spend much time on the animations, I gradually realized that higher frame rates looked better. Who would have guessed? And so with that knowledge, I made increasingly okay animations. These animations were about half big army Star Wars battles and half lightsaber battles. You can extrapolate my interest at the time. The main Sega of animations was all about Darth Jar Jar, which I thought was hilarious at the time. And yeah, so you can extrapolate my sense of humor at the time from that as well. Although the very early ones were messy and had no background, which let you see the very distracting things my brothers were doing in the background, by the final entry of the Sega, I had custom made LEGO models and sets, an actual backdrop made with the back of a board game, and a pretty interesting and well done final battle scene. And by well done, I mean in comparison to the rest of the stuff I was turning out at the time. But anyways, I hear you asking, when am I going to get to game dev in this game dev video? Now. I'm getting to it now. Seriously, calm down. Everyone here has probably heard of Scratch. It's a simple, web-based way to make games and share them. It's for kids. So naturally, I didn't really use Scratch. Later on, I ended up doing it sometimes in school projects. But at home, I didn't really want to use the computer. I wanted to use my aforementioned iPad Mini. So I looked around and eventually found Hopscotch, which was basically Scratch, but on phones. Once again, with that first generation iPad Mini in hand, I got to creating some of the most original and genius games ever. Yeah, right. I followed his tutorial or two and then moved on to make my own junk. With Hopscotch, or at least how it was whenever I used it, you couldn't actually use your own images, so you had to use basic shapes and text alongside some characters that they had. You could also draw stuff with code, but that only really worked for backgrounds as that drawn stuff couldn't move. Looking through all the stuff that I made, well, it's a lot of the same, really. I made a really janky hoverboard endless runner. Then I made a bad Flappy Bird clone where you need to go to the moon, but for some reason there are tiny moons that you need to avoid on your way there. They were probably supposed to be asteroids. And then slightly more interestingly, a Doodle Jump clone in a game where you catch burgers, and oh my gosh, it's the return of the JFM already? That's crazy. But then, I decided to basically make the moon game again, but this time I added a short launch sequence before the game, better controls, and some UI. Also, it's going to Mars now. I remember finishing this game, naming it To Mars or Bust, and publishing it, and then going to bed. I never had too much success in my games up to this point whenever it came to the whole social media part of Hopscotch, but that next morning, I got to experience my very first taste of popularity on the internet. I remember checking through that day as I watched my game rise in popularity due to being featured on the front page by the creators of Hopscotch. This this front page led to a steady flow of follow and like notifications for me, and eventually I reached the absolutely insane number of 16.7 uh, thousand plays in my game. At least it was insane for me at the time. I think that getting that first feature and the high that came from it really influenced what I did on Hopscotch from then on, and it probably deterred me from working on more unique projects, as I thought that games like Two Mars or Bust were what would get me features, and I gave the people what they wanted, by making more endless runners. And this was also reinforced when most of my higher effort games and more unique ideas, like a boss fight, were completely ignored, and instead I had another endless runner which I made on a whim pack run be featured. And I remember also thinking that was a big deal at this point, and I even changed my username from Billy Bob Joe 7 to the real Billy Bob Joe, just in case anybody was trying to impersonate me. If I had to critique Hopscotch for anything, then first off, I would complain about some of the weird quirks of the game engine. First off, like Scratch, there's no camera or easy way of making one, so your game is generally going to be confined to just one screen. I feel like cameras would not be that difficult to add in, and they would just allow for much more interesting games. But whatever, it is a tool for like babies. Also, I remember some really bad performance and strange collision issues with some of the shapes just not registering collisions with others. But in my mind, the social media side is a bit more iffy. I don't think it was ideal to make features such a massive boost and pretty much the only way to get any plays on a game. I understand that it was mostly for the sake of moderation, but it led to 99% of projects, even those made by popular creators who have tons of followers, to get very few plays. Plus, having a relatively huge viral explosion of a game is probably not the best mentally for kids. Ideally, a system that rewards a steady growth would be better, but kids and social media don't really mix that well in general, so I don't really know about making one for them, but whatever. Nevertheless, Hopscotch was a place where I first began to learn how to make my own video games, and also where I experienced my first bit of social media success, however fleeting that may have been. And for better or worse, both of these experiences would guide many of my future actions and choices. 
I guess at this point in time, I decided to get distracted from game development and instead refocus my goals on getting the career that every kid aspires to have, a YouTuber. And believe me, I went into this new venture with very realistic goals and expectations. After doing some very scientific research by looking at my favorite YouTuber at the time, Mumbo Jumbo's oldest uploads, I determined that I could settle for a very respectable 10,000 subscribers from the release of my first video. So I got to work. Armed with a weird screen recorder, iMovie for the iPad, and Minecraft Pocket Edition, I slowly put together a horrible redstone tutorial. I was not good at redstone, and I didn't even like it that much. But it was what Mumbo Jumbo had done, so I knew that I had to recreate that in order to be successful. And I was awful at voicing the video, so I had to redub the majority of the lines. I'm gonna use green and orange. These are the colors that will be on. They'll be correct. Plus, I had to correct thousands of mistakes that I made in the screen recording of the video of me building it with cuts. Plus, this was Bedrock Edition Redstone, which meant that nothing really worked and my thing wouldn't even work half the time. But finally, I put together a nice 20 minute long tutorial that basically taught you nothing. I remember that my parents made me present this video in front of them and my brothers before they would give me permission to upload the video on YouTube. And that might have been one of the worst 20 minutes of my life. Still, somehow I thought that this was okay to post online, because where other place to put this trash that I could barely stand watching myself than into the vast, uncaring void of the internet? Needless to say, it took a little bit longer than expected to get those 10,000 subscribers, and I've gone through a ridiculous amount of channel rebrandings and refocusings on the way there. The first one I did was I switched to making pixel art sprite animations, which were honestly much better than the Minecraft tutorials. The video Yoshi Gets His Revenge might be the single best thing that I have ever created. But after doing that for a little while, I learned about Storytime Animators, and I realized that this was the real wave that I needed to catch. And so I poured months of work into every video, learning about scripting and planning out the videos, and even a little bit of animation, although my videos were still basically slideshows with poorly drawn lip sync. All this work resulted in very low quality videos that were also simultaneously incredibly high effort and ridiculously rushed at the same time. My priorities when making these videos were really weird, as I would spend incredibly long amounts of time just editing and animating short sections of the videos that I could still never really get to look right, and then I would just rush through the rest of the video. And my attempts at comedy were not good, even though I can't say that's really changed that much until now. After this fun time making story time animations, I decided that I wanted to be Scott the Waz instead. So I made some game reviews, realized that nobody cared about my opinions, and then I made what was pretty much a Scott the Waz video. It was about shovelware Wii games, and I guess it wasn't that bad, other than the voiceover. And I kid you not, a week later, Scott the Waz uploaded a video about shovelware games, and most of them were on the Wii. Yeah, here it is folks, Scott exposed for stealing my terrible videos. I can't believe that all these famous celebrities keep stealing all my ideas. SMH my head, I must really be a genius. And then I finally came up with a slightly unique idea for content, and decided to make video game history videos. I only knew of a couple channels doing these, and I was kinda interested in it, so I made a few videos in this style. These videos still took me weeks of constant editing and scripting to make as I was so slow at editing, and all my research was pretty much just ripped from Wikipedia, but I still learned quite a bit while making these videos. But it just turns out that after making a few of these videos and they didn't really do very well, I just kinda got bored of the whole thing. After a few more random pit stops, I finally turned into the lane that I'm still driving down, game development devlogs. It's interesting looking back because I can still see a lot of my past in my channel, and it's not just because I left a lot of these videos as public on my channel. I have this goofy avatar guy that I sometimes put in when I can't think of any better b-roll, and this is reminiscent of my storytime animator days, and I learned a lot about what I know about scripting and making videos during this time. And the more high effort videos like the ones I made during the video game history days are somewhat similar to the video essays like the one that I'm making right now. And my process for making one is similar, even though those old videos which were like 10 minutes long, I now can make nearly hour long videos in less time than it took to make that one. So I've definitely gotten a lot faster at it. Plus, I hope my videos are better than they were back then. And I even use some of the principles of animation that I learned in sprite animation in my games and videos today. But yeah, my content was really not good for the first several views of making videos. Even knowing that, looking back, I can remember being really discouraged making videos for so long and gaining so little traction. But I'm glad I hung on for long enough to get kinda lucky and grow this decent sized fan base. I really enjoy making videos, even if I don't really want to do YouTube professionally in the future. I'd much rather be making video games. I do hope to continue to make some cool videos, and also maybe get some free marketing from showing off my stuff on here.
And now, once again, we return to actually talking about game development in this video about game development. My first game engine was Game Maker Studio, and I had and have a very love-hate relationship with it. I was inspired to finally pick up Game Maker Studio and start making games for real after playing Crashlands by the wonderful game developers Buttershaw Shenanigans. I played Crashlands on my aforementioned first-generation iPad Mini, and I absolutely loved it. Now, Crashlands is an RPG that draws from influences such as Don't Starve and Terraria, and really is a pretty fantastic mobile game that was 100% designed for a handheld experience. But the reason why this game in particular got me interested in game development again was because Butterscotch has a website and podcast where they have lots of behind the scenes info for their development process and history. And they also have lots of their jam games that they show off. And in this, they mentioned quite a bit about what engine they use, which happens to be Game Maker Studio 2. So I wanted to make games. So I downloaded the free Game Maker Studio 1 and decided to learn some stuff. Now, while Game Maker has a lot of issues about which I'll get into later, it does have some very good integrated tutorials. Tutorials, so I was able to learn the basics through the Breakout Clone tutorial. And after messing around with GMS for a little while, I decided to convince my parents to let me buy an impulse purchase. Game Maker Studio 2 was a shiny new upgrade, but the reason that I wanted to use it was because for the low, low price of just $400, I too could export my incredible games to mobile. Keep in mind, I was mostly just using my iPad to play games, and the only computer I had at the time was my family's old computer. Which, while not a terrible computer, it was clearly not built for Windows 10, and was also probably loaded with bloatware by me. So I wanted to make iPad games, and this seemed to be the way to do it. But as I would soon realize, getting Game Maker for this purpose was a mistake. You see, Game Maker Studio only works on a Windows PC, which I had, but you need a Mac to export to iOS, which was a problem. Luckily my mom had an old MacBook which it would work with, but the process to connect these computers together and then connect them to iPad and then export was just too much for 6th grade me. I'm sure that Unity isn't much better in this aspect, is it's not really the engine's fault, it's more of the iOS's fault. But I kinda wish I had known this before getting into it. It also didn't help that the documentation was less than stellar. Anyways, this put a huge stall on my game making journey, because I couldn't really use Game Maker to make mobile games like I wanted to do. And since I couldn't figure that out, I didn't really get anything done. But also around, and probably a little bit before this time, I was keeping a notebook full of plans for my dream game. Pages of systems and areas and bosses and stories for a game that I never even started to make. But what was this dream game anyways? Well, it was the surprising return of the glorious Arena of Stuff. Yes, the paper game that wasn't really a game was what I wanted to turn into my first video game, and my plans for it were very grand. For gameplay, well, I had just played Undertale. I wanted a bullet hell RPG, and most of my characters and boss ideas were just rip-offs of Undertale characters. Even the general structure of the story was planned to be similar to Undertale's, and I was planning on having similar four-fall breaking stuff because I played Undertale, and that had it in it, so naturally I had to have it in my game too. The thing is, at the time I was planning all these things, I really did not realize I was ripping off Undertale. It just seems like the best way to do it for me. I guess I really had not experienced that many other games, and especially not that many other RPGs, which is what I wanted to make. So I just drew from the one I knew. But anyways, when it finally came time for me to put all these genius and original ideas to action in Game Maker, I realized I pretty much had no idea where to start or what I was even doing. So yeah, I pretty much gave up again. And unfortunately, I have to fast forward quite a bit because I really do a lot of nothing for a while. All these roadblocks and all the stresses that come up being a 6th grader kind of got in the way. But in 2017, Butterscotch was holding a game jam called the Shenana Jam. A game jam is an organized event where a bunch of game developers make a game in a short period of time. In this case, 72 hours. You also generally have themes, and people will sometimes vote on what's the best game. And the Shenana Jam had both of these. But in the Shenana Jam, there were actually a few themes you could choose from, and all the themes were actually titles from Beastcotch's podcast. But the one I chose was Boyd Burger. I mentioned it before, but I really love this theme system, as most game jams have these really generic and like mechanics based themes. These are more just like goofy ideas that you can kind of build a game off of. Like Void Burger really does not lead to a specific idea for a game, but rather I think it's a fun thing to theme your game around, which is really what I think themes should do, but anyways. I set out to actually make a game in 48 hours. Yo-Yo Games, who made Game Maker Studio 2, even provided a temporary PC export license which you could use to export your jam games, even if you didn't own Game Maker. So I got started and quickly realized that I had no idea what I was doing. I had trouble coming up with a good game idea, but I finally decided on making a tiny game, where you play as a cheese grater, which stops cheese from reaching a hamburger and ruining its beautiful beautiful blandness. But I had trouble getting anything to work and ended up basically just having a player controller that could shoot a projectile and then a broken spawning system that would often create unwinnable situations. While my resulting game wasn't very good, I still submitted it and it got me back into game development. And I already had a big new idea for a project. 
Project Astro. That's what I called my new idea. And honestly, it was kind of a weird idea. It was a Metroidvania with a fast-paced movement system and some bullet hell influences. But this was weird because I had never played a Metroidvania before now. So I just decided to make a game in a genre that I didn't even know I liked. Good move. Nevertheless, I started with a platformer movement system, and with the help of some heartbeat tutorials and a lot of work, I was able to make a pretty smooth movement system. It had wall sliding, wall jumping, a jetpack, and was momentum based, which meant that you can build up speed by chaining together moves. So while it was mostly built from tutorials, it was leaps and bounds above everything else I had done before. At the same time, I decided to finally start making my first game development videos. I had watched a YouTuber called Mix and Jam, who basically would just recreate mechanics from games in Unity. So I figured I would do just that. So I made some Mario enemies in a video, and then I also made a Katana Zero Bullet Time video. And weirdly enough, this is the video that I still get contacted about the most. Even many, many years later, I still get emails, comments, and Discord messages asking how I did the bullet time and also for the sprites from Katana Zero. I kind of showed how to do both in the video, but whatever. Also, I know I've talked a lot about copyright infringement up to this point, but I'm not about to distribute the sprites that I ripped from Control and Zero. I don't know if that's illegal or not, but I'm not taking the chances. I continued work on Project Astro and added a shooting and a basic enemy, but at this point, I was mostly focused on my YouTube channel. I really wasn't getting views, so I decided that I needed to steal views from Mr. Sweden himself, PewDiePie. He was doing his Minecraft thing at this time, and I decided to try and get my games to be popular on a subreddit. So I decided to make an iPhone stacker game called Tower of Llama The Game. And so I got to work, and after a few weeks, I had a stacker game with some power-ups, basic pixel art, and a little store of skins. So now came the most important part of this project, the marketing. I spent a while in this video, and I think that it actually still holds up to this day, unlike a lot of my other videos around the time. I also made a trailer for this video, and then I got to posting that trailer on Reddit. So, I had to make a title for the post. Hmm, I made a PewDiePie fan game. No, wait. How about, after a month of work, give or take, I made a Tower of Llama fan game. And then, I posted the trailer, and in the comments, I posted a link to my video. The genius part? I hadn't released my game yet. So that way, I knew I could make a part 2 video. And so that people would subscribe so they can know when I release the game, and then they would watch the part 2 video. Genius. And so, I waited and waited, but after only a few minutes, the post was completely buried on PewDiePie's subreddit. At this point, I had to decide how to continue. Do I concede and give up on that sweet, sweet Reddit karma? Or do I commit the worst crime known to man and repost my own content? I chose the genocide route. I reposted the post once about every hour for a day or two. I was also using a Jiffy Cat link, which made it much easier to do. I made slight alterations to the post title each time, and eventually, I got what I wanted. Internet fame and fortune flooded in. I got infinite Reddit gold. All the Discord Nitro I could ever ask for. The kind strangers worship me. My only fan simps paid all the bills I... I got around a thousand views on the video. And honestly, this is a lot for me at the time, so I was pretty happy with it. Crime, well, at least breaking Reddit rules, does pay off, kids. I finally finished the game and released it, finally making use of the mobile export package that I had bought. Of course, I still didn't have iOS figured out, so I just released it on Android. It was way easier to do this in only 20 bucks. I got around a thousand downloads on this free game and quite a few 5 star reviews on it. It really was not that bad of a game, even though it was super simple. I still look back on it fondly, even though I really was never that big of a PewDiePie fan, so it's kind of funny that I made a game for him. I really was just fiending for those views. By this point, I had once again taken a huge break from my main project while I was focused on these other videos, so I figured that I would try something new. I had been watching these little-known YouTubers like Danny and Brackies, and they were doing this cool new type of video, a devlog. They were making a game, and then they were making videos about making their games. I thought, hey, I'm making a game before realizing that that wasn't really true, so I figured that I would make a big first video. I laid out the plan. I would spend one month overhauling my game and working on it every day, and then I would post a video about that month of work. The first week, it didn't go well. I really did not get anything done as about to just give up. But then I came to my senses and just called the next week week one and started anew that second week. I made new enemies, added pathfinding to the game, and just got back into the swing of things. I finished the rest of the weeks and then made that first devlog, and it ended up being way more successful than my PewDiePie video ever was. Another important skill that I learned at this point was fast editing. It used to take me weeks just to edit videos. I don't know why it did, probably just perfectionism. But by simply forcing myself to do it quickly, I edited much faster and the videos actually improved in quality somehow. Another big factor in this improvement was probably the fact that I improved my voiceover skills substantially, which made my videos slightly less awkward and painful to watch. 
but after this, I finally began to consistently develop my game and also release devlogs. At first I had a weekly schedule, but after a little bit of that, I switched to a more flexible schedule of around one video every two weeks. The game was certainly evolving and I was starting to get better at pixel art, and if you want to hear more about the development of the specific projects, then you can watch the devlogs that I made over it. So I'm going to instead focus more on the behind the scenes parts of development. I began to realize that I did not have a very clear plan for the game. In fact, I still hadn't even played a Metroidvania yet, so I decided to play a few. I played some of Hollow Knight, and some of Metroid Fusion, and a lot of Castlevania Araya of Shadow, and I did enjoy my time with the games, but I just realized that it wasn't really what I wanted to make. My original idea was basically just that you can run around and dodge bullets, and the rest of the game was mostly vague daydreams of a massive spaceship and cool atmospheric design. But I became keenly aware of the massive difference between what I was currently able to do, and what a project of this scope and quality would demand of me. But I continued to work on the game for a little while, and I built some more cool stuff. The graphics actually got okay with a lighting system that I added. The map was okay, and I built a cool boss fight at the end of the first area. But as I finished with this first area, I realized that I really did not want to make any more areas. This was supposed to be the simplest and smallest of the areas in the ship, and it had already taken me like 6 months to make it. And so I was just ready to move on to something new. So I kind of packaged up the game, and then moved on. At this point, I was fairly familiar with Game Maker Studio 2, but I was also interested in the Unity game engine. It looked pretty sweet, there were all these assets, you can make 3D games that didn't look like they were made in the early 90s, and Unity was a good keyword to put in your video titles. So I gave it a shot. I initially tried out Unity by just building a little top-down shooter. It took me two weeks to finish it, and I remember being frustrated by Unity's design early on. But even then, I realized just how many useful tools that Unity had that Game Maker lacked. There was an inspector, the prefab and game object system was just much more intuitive, and there was an actual UI system. I still don't know how GameMaker can justify making you use an entire code-based UI system. It's just very frustrating to use and unintuitive. And, while I'm at it, I think I'll make a little review of my thoughts about GameMaker Studio. Personally, I think it does a lot right. It's simple to understand and get into, and I really do love the interface of GameMaker Studio too, with all the windows that you can zoom in and out of. But a lot of the engine just seems archaic. Referencing other objects is very difficult, and the lack of a component system is a very baffling decision in my mind, as it severely limits the amount of abstraction that you can have, or at least makes abstraction more difficult for people who aren't as into programming. And also, now it's a subscription service which is insane in my opinion, it's supposed to be for like beginner devs. I guess they need to make their money, but this is really not where they should be going for it. But I do want to give a few more props to GameMaker, as I appreciate the inclusion of a built-in sprite editor, and the animation system is simple and very solid. But switching to Unity was one of the best things I think I ever did. I get it, Unity has its issues as well, but I found that works well with the sort of projects I've been making, so I'm sticking with it for now. And now, I'm finally getting to what has been the main project on my channel for the last two and a half years. I have been looking for a good split-screen multiplayer FPS on PC for a while, and I really didn't find any. So, I decided to make Couch Combat. And that took a while. I originally decided to take up a project like Couch Combat because I thought that it would allow me a bit more freedom in working on it. Basically, I wanted to just build the base of the game in a few months, and then I could spend however long after that just making content, and then I could release the game whenever I wanted to. But that didn't really end up happening, as the base just took way longer than I expected. But nevertheless, I began the development of Couch Combat. Couch Combat was my first 3D game, and it took a while for me to acclimate to working in a 3D environment. I was actually so bad at using the camera and transform tools at first, that in the first devlog, you can see that the blocks that made up the level were floating slightly above the ground, and I literally could not figure out how to get those back down. And also work on the game was slow and messy, but I got into movement system, shooting system, multiple players, and the game started to work. Early on, I struggled quite a bit in making the game look nice. I don't think that I found a good art style until around a year in development. But speaking of art style, at the beginning of development, I was accused pretty often of being a Carlson clone. This never bothered me too much, as after all, I did have a decent amount of similarities to Carlson. But honestly, both Couch Combat and Carlson are pretty simple games. I'm pretty sure the low poly blue dudes with bright colors has been done many times before, and will probably be done a few more times before the heat death of the universe. While I was working on Couch Combat, I also took a lot of breaks to spend time doing game jams. I did these jams in order to take a break, make videos about them, and also just to learn stuff. I've had videos on every single jam I've done on my channel. So here, I'm just going to talk about the ones that were particularly good or bad. The first 3D Unity game I ever made was for the 2020 GMTK Game Jam. I made a little game about riding on a hoverboard, based off this cool tutorial I found online. The controls for it were pretty janky, and I had no idea of how to make a proper third-person camera at the time, but it ended up being a perfectly fine game in the end. Plus, the video was my first to ever hit 10,000 views, which was pretty cool. Another thing that I try to do with game jams is try different tools. 
I've done game jams with Unity, Game Maker Studio, Godot, and with Anna Engine using Pygame. Though my games for these jams are never as good as the ones I make whenever I don't try to use a new tool, it's still a lot of fun to try to learn new tools in such a short time. And I really like a few of the concepts that I've come up with and tried out in game jams in the past. And I might even try coming back to some of them. Brock and the Glock was the game I made in Pygame. And it was a platformer where you propelled yourself with a massive Glock. I think a 2D platformer where you have a variety of weird weapons to move with could be really fun. The Final Frontier was a pretty simple game I made, which is a first-person speedrunning platformer, and it was a ton of fun to work on and make. I have an idea for a side project that I can make that takes inspiration from the Final Frontier as well as games like Neon White, and I think working on this could be a fun break from the game I'm working on right now. And One Big Boss Fight, which is currently the most popular game jam entry I made, is a bit of the basis for my current game, Project Seaborn which I'll get to at the end of the video. I have also often made games based on franchises or games that I like. Making Minecraft and Unity was one of the most challenging projects that I have ever done. I ended up having to follow a tutorial for most of the time, but I still learned a ton about data structures and procedural generation. I also made a small Attack on Titan fan game, which I later updated into a little boss fight, and also made the Four Runes and Glider from Breath of the Wild, and later I even made the time rewinding mechanic from Breath of the Wild 2 trailers. These fan projects are interesting to do every once in a while, plus they work well for resumes, and of course, most importantly, they seem to do pretty well on YouTube. And after all, if I can't monetize it by having thousands of people watch it, then why even do anything in the first place? This is a joke. But getting back to Couch Combat, I really enjoyed development of it for a long time. But eventually, probably around a year and a half into the project, I began to get tired of it. I also happened to have the idea for my next project around this time too, so you can probably guess why I was getting tired. I've had this problem several times, I have pretty big ideas and plans for my games, but I almost inevitably get burnt out of working on these projects after a while. I know I should probably just make smaller projects for now, but smaller projects are not what I have ideas for or what I really want to make, and in the end I just want to make the games I want to make, so I don't really have a solution for this. It's not like I hated Couch Combat by the end of development or anything, but honestly I'd rather die than have to go in and work on online multiplayer for that game again. But after finishing up its development, I released Couch Combat on Steam on July 13th, 2022, over two years years after I published the first devlog on August 23rd, 2020. Once again, I got into more specific detail about my release statistics in another video, but the release was okay. My initial purchases were pretty low, but it picked up over time. Overall, it wasn't ever really about the sales, mostly just about making a full game and learning how to do that. It was mostly a bonus to make a bit of money and also have a release game, but I did realize that I really don't like the whole process of releasing games. I like starting games, and I mostly like working on games, but it's so hard to finish them, and when I finish Couch Combat, my regrets mostly drowned out the good parts of releasing it. But now that it's a few months later, I am so glad to be moving on from Couch Combat. And now it kind of seems like we're all caught up. I just released Couch Combat, and so what's the next step? Well, if you've been watching my videos, or heard me mention it earlier, or read the title card that I just showed, it's Project Seaborn. Project Seaborn is the working title of my new game, and it's a top-down action RPG of some party-based elements to add a bit more strategy to it. It's early on in development, but I've been planning it out for around a year at this point. It's kind of funny, because Project Seaborn is pretty much the revival of Arena of Stuff. Finally, I'm going to work on my dream project, which is totally not an Undertale knockoff. So I'll be sure to include some references to that Total Hood classic in Project Seaborn. Currently, I'm super excited to be working on it as I've been planning it for so long. I've got tons of ideas for systems, and I'd really like to make something more unique and complete than Couch Combat was. I'm happy with how it turned out, but it really is just an arcade game that you play at friends. Don't get me wrong, many of my favorite games of all times have been games like that, but I want to make a more traditional, story-based, linear game. Before I get to the end of this video, I just want to talk about a few of my favorite games and biggest influences. I've already mentioned these first guys a few times in this video, but I have Crashlands and Butterscotch shenanigans to thank for getting me into game development in the first place. It's unlikely I would have even started without them. And the story of how the three brothers who founded Beastgosh powered through their artist Sam getting cancer three times before and during the development of Crashlands is incredible. Secondly, Undertale. I was ridiculously obsessed with Undertale in middle school. I still kind of am, if you couldn't tell from the 40 minute video essay that I made over it last year. It's just a great game with great characters and lore that I've continued to enjoy up to now. Deltarune is my current most anticipated game and its first two chapters have been fantastic. Next, some of the game devs I've taken influence from. First, Danny. I may be taking a little bit too much influence in the past from him, but even though he never uploads, he still has made some fantastic games and videos, and I'm still a believer in Carlson. It'll come back. Someday. I've been following Mrs's for forever, and his approach to lore and game concepts are unrivaled. It's no surprise that I've seen him go viral like four times at this point. Rot Flesh is my favorite devlog series of all time, and the game is pretty cool too. And finally, I can't really go without mentioning Idaws, who made Arch 
much fail. I followed his devlog series for years and the game turned out fantastic. And I'm very obviously taking influence from the way he did top down bullet hells and I've been doing so since before Archfell was even out. Also Amori goes without saying, I probably used like 20 Amori songs during this video already. So I think that speaks for itself. But if you really want to hear me talk about Amori more, then I kind of have a video for that. But that's pretty much all I have to say in this video. It's been a long one and I feel a bit weird talking so much about myself. So hopefully it wasn't too bad to sit through. I'd love to hear any of your stories and journeys in game development or whatever you want to talk about in the comments. I recently have started rebranding my channel a little bit as I'm going to be focusing more on these video essays. So you'll probably mostly just be getting video essays and devlogs from here on out, with the occasional game jam thrown in there. Thanks again to SNH2 for sponsoring this video and be sure to check them out. Bye.